So to slightly switch gears and go to our other fuel source and move into like fat oxidization and metabolic efficiency, the kind of an old school approach to improving that fat oxidization was like fasted zone two rides with the idea that you could change fat max. Actually, maybe to start out, can you explain what fat max is for someone who's not sure? And then what's the modern thinking around how you manipulate or train fat max? So fat max as a concept is actually the exercise intensity at which you burn most fat. Whereas usually we use it as a like fat max, the maximal capacity to oxidize fats in terms of grams per minute. Um, so how good you are at using fats. Um, when you look at like a cycling race four, five, six hours, um, or even like if we're talking about uh, gravel, even more than this, definitely your capacity to use more fat becomes beneficial because this means that you use carbohydrates which are highly limited at a lower um, rate. Um, so fat oxidation rates are really important in my opinion um, in modern cycling, um, just as they were like years ago. The difference to how we look at it, at least how I look at it, is that I don't try to actively increase the fat oxidation rates. Um, so I will not go and recommend a rider like, oh, now we will train your fat oxidation rates by doing faster training or not giving you any carbohydrates for this session. Um, because fat oxidation rates will increase naturally with the fitness level. So okay. if you take someone that is eating a lot of carbohydrates, uh, but also trains a lot and has a really high VO2 max, um, so higher, high capacity to use, use oxygen, this person's capacity to use fat will be way higher than somebody on a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet and his VO2 max is like 35 or 40. Yeah. So it's the fat oxidation is a byproduct, there's an effective training plan. But even if it's a secondary goal in terms of training adaptation for the day, is there any considerations for you when you're setting a session for somebody, even in terms of fueling, where you'd go, okay, we're going to fuel at the lower end. Maybe today for a zone two ride, we're going to fuel at 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrates as opposed to 80 to 90 because we have this secondary goal of fat oxidation. Um, I would not like just look at fat oxidation. I would be thinking, okay, it's a zone two ride. It's an easy ride. How do we make most of this right? And by making most of the right is like, in, for instance, like during the intervals, the power output and the, like the stress on the muscles will be the biggest um, impact and the stress on the cardiovascular system. Whereas on a low intensity ride, it will be metabolic stress in terms of like um, the flux of energy through these five hours or six hours and um, the basically lack of energy in the muscle. Um, and this way you can basically potentiate the um, adaptations. Um, so perhaps if you kind of reduce the energy availability for this particular session, you might get bigger adaptations. The question is how well you recover from such session, um, which if you do it wrong, you can perhaps finish the ride five hours faster with no carbohydrates. Um, you will get great adaptations, but the problem is that you will not recover. So it's always a balance between yeah. kind of adaptive response and the recovery. Um, so you need to basically find a balance between minimal fueling so that you kind of create this metabolic stress that will increase the um, molecular responses while not making the rider not recover for the next session. Horrible. Good or bad? Amazing. <laughs> My homie. <laughs> I'm flat out on the Haribo. It's like everyone's on their, you know, little packets of gels. And I just, there's so many problems even, but even just the waste of the gel wrappers alone kind of annoys me. It's like one bag of Haribo, you're, the, the size bags we're getting, I think, are 95 grams of carbohydrates for roughly one euro fifty. I'm like, it's just value. <laughs> it's just value. Yeah, um, I think it was a couple of years ago or three years ago during one of the Tour de France, and I was like trying to find out what to give the riders because they were so flavor fatigued. And we ended up with giving them different flavors of Haribo into the uh, musette. Um, and I think it was received pretty well. Um, they always the little fried eggs. Oh, they're magic. 
<laughs> in Rebels. <laughs> yeah. And if you're, I'm sure you spent some time in Girona, uh, but they have the Haribo factory just outside Girona on the way into Bagnoles. What a, what a place. It's like Disneyland for cyclists. Yeah, I mean, you can't overdo them because they're like so easy to eat. So like when the riders are trying to lose the weight, you probably need to stay away from them. Um, but when it comes to like hard days in the mountains and you just need them to eat like, I don't know, in a day, 20 or 21 grams per kilogram of carbohydrates, then you're like, yeah, Haribo are the best friend. <laughs> Is there any role for ketones? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I'm personally not a fan of them. Um, I just don't see that big of a value in them, um, especially given their price, because yeah. I feel in my experiences that professional cycling is professional. They earn and they make a lot of money. Um, but when it comes to like the stuff and, the, everything around, like how things are organized, um, there is never enough money. They would always try to invest more money into like getting better chefs, getting better food quality. Um, and I feel like the money you spend on ketones can be used elsewhere um, bet and get better results than ketones for like re improving recovery or training adaptations. But if you have everything ticked, uh, all the boxes ticked and you're like, this is the final thing that you can do, then perhaps ketones can give like that 0.1% um, at the end. And we talked about fat oxidization and to tag that back into the very start of the conversation, we were talking about rider leanness. Is there a change in fat oxidization rates when riders get exceptionally lean? I wouldn't expect and wouldn't say that, no. Um, perhaps when they're trying to reduce the body mass um, in that period, fat oxidation rates will obviously be higher just because there will be less fuel to in carbohydrates. So yeah. um, you might see like somebody doing a view to max test in the lab, like a recreational cyclist, and his um, fat oxidation during the test would be really low. And you're like, mm, what have you eaten the previous day? And they would be like, oh yeah, like I have, was not eating a lot of carbohydrates. Oh, this explains these values. Um, yeah. And sometimes they're cooked basically being on uh, over trained and you also see this because they're simply not recovering fat oxidation rates are up but yeah and do you see body composition changes throughout a season because you know previously it was quite extreme you know you take like who's the most extreme example probably big jan jan ulrich back in the day would come into january training camp maybe 10 kilograms overweight race all the way through and you'd see him gradually on front of your eyes from Tour of Swiss to Dauphiné to Tour de France changing physique and then again you see him in January and he's massive again it was like his training was periodized but his body composition was almost periodized as well are we seeing riders just staying lean all year round now or is there a cutting process yeah they're kind of relatively lean all year round but they definitely put on weight I think Demi Wallering um, just made a really good comment about this, how she's kind of like tried to like reduce the body mass for the Tour de France and the peak of the season, but then her body mass would go up. And I think it's pretty much for majority of the riders similar. Um, the problem becomes for the riders that are like supposed to race the whole year. We are not talking about like the GC riders, but the helpers, their fat um, content or like the amount of fat they have on the body will probably be a bit higher than for GC riders, um, just because they need to basically sustain um, and race for like pretty, probably for like five, six months without a proper break, proper like training camp. Whereas like GC riders can afford to basically like just nail this like peak of the season and be super lean in that part. Um, but everyone is kind of picking with the body mass and playing around. Um, there are some riders that yeah gain more weight, um, but definitely not to the extent that yeah, Nordi was doing it. What do the Giro d'Italia stage slayer Mads Pedersen and half the professional peloton have in common? Well, they're all turning to Nomeo, the natural performance enhancer proven to reduce lactate buildup during intense efforts. In the 2025 Giro d'Italia, Pedersen's form was undeniable. The Danish star surged to four stage victories. This was a major leap in form from his previous season, and a key part of this preparation and performance was Nomeo. Developed by the same researchers who discovered the performance power of diet 
dietary nitrate. You know those beetroot shots that half the peloton were using? Gnomeo is clinically proven to lower lactate levels, reduce oxidative stress, improve training adaptations, and deliver a noticeable boost from the very first time you take it. Riders are reporting bigger threshold power, fresher legs mid-race, and quicker recovery, all from a formula made with just three natural ingredients. Broccoli sprouts, lemon, and sugar. Whether you're racing at the front or you're smashing local segments, Nomeo helps you get more out of every ride. Take it before key sessions or races for an immediate edge or take your training to the next level and get more out of your hard work. Go to drinknomeo.com, that's N-O-M-I-O, -O, and check out this game-changing supplement. Details are in the episode show notes or description down below.